So I think we'll go ahead and get started. I think we'll be joined by other people, you know, as we come in. Um, but I don't want to, the speakers have been very kind to come early and um, to join us today for this, this inaugural corridor conversations talk. I want to welcome everybody who's come today. I'm Lisa Walker. Uh, I'm chair of the board of Hyattsville Aging in Place. Um, I'm one of the planners of Corridor Conversations. Uh, there are four of us involved, four organizations involved, um, Hyattsville Aging in Place, Helping Hands, University Park, uh, Neighbors, Helping Neighbors, College Park, and Explorations in Aging College Park. Each one of us have done our own programs previously, but we've been working together more and more. And what we wanted to do with Corridor Conversations was to do some more fun, not specifically focused on aging issues that might appeal to all of the, the communities up and down Route 1 and um, would appeal to all ages. So this is the first of these events and we're really excited that we're doing it in February, which is uh, Black History Month and it allows us to focus right in on um, Black Lives Matter and North Brentwood and its establishment in 1887 uh, and its incorporation in 1924, which made it the first African-American community in Prince George's County. Um, we're, we've got great speakers here today and my nose is gonna run, so that's great. Um, so um, this also gives us an opportunity to look at black history and social justice in, um, in Prince George's County and the empowerment of black residents. So we're really happy to have our speakers with us. Um, uh, we are recording the session, as I said before, if you don't wanna be recorded, um, take your video off screen. Um, we are gonna keep the microphones muted. So if you want to ask questions of our speakers, um, if you will just put those questions in the chat box, we will uh, take them up after people speak. Um, All righty, so we're really excited to have Mayor Petrello Robinson of North Brentwood and Chanel Compton, board chair of the Prince George's African American Museum and Cultural Center in North Brentwood. Um, I'm gonna briefly introduce them both first and then call on Mayor uh, Robinson to speak. They'll each speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll move to questions. Uh, again, feel free to put questions in the chat box. We will take them up after they've spoken. Um, Mayor Ro Robinson is a longtime resident of North Brentwood. I believe she was born there, grew up there, and has been a council member, clerk, and now mayor since 2007. Over these years, she's worked um, tirelessly to bring North Brentwood's history to the eyes of county and state government. She's an active member of the North Brentwood Citizens Association, North Brentwood Historical Society, and the Maryland Black Mayors. We're pleased to have her share with us information about the founding, development, and growth of North Brentwood. And Chanel Compton is the board chair of Prince George's African American Museum and Cultural Center in North Brentwood. She's a former executive director and education coordinator of the museum, but she is, she is now the executive director of the Banneker Douglas Museum, the state of Maryland's uh, official African-American uh, history museum, which is in Annapolis. Previously, uh, Ms. Compton has been the director of education at the Creative Alliance at Patterson and a program coordinator at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. We're gonna start with Mayor Robinson, at, who will talk about the founding and development of North Brentwood. Mayor Robinson. Good afternoon, everyone. As you stated, I'm Mayor Petrella Robinson of the town of North Brentwood. I am glad to be a part of this Black History Month event. I want to thank um, uh, Highsville Aging in Place. Um, I always, my colleague, Prince uh, Chanel Compton of the Prince George's African American Museum and Cultural Center. My colleague, uh, Candace Hollingsworth, who was mayor of um, Hyattsville. I'm also um, um, glad to see and be a part of this under the University Park Helping Hands and other entities. 
Glad to get the invite. Good afternoon to all the participants. I'm just going to tell a little brief story of my life in North Brentwood as I grew up here in North Brentwood. Um, I left North Brentwood and got married and um, settled other places, Washington, D.C., most of the time in Oxon Hill, Maryland. And I re, uh, got married and, and returned to North Brentwood, uh, where I was raised. I was raised by my great aunt. And um, I came to North Brentwood at three years old, and um, she raised me. And that's where I stayed for through, through my uh, years. And I did ten, attend some colleges, uh, college courses in University of Maryland. Black History Month in Prince George's County has to include the town of North Brentwood. As um, stated, the town is the first African-American incorporated municipality in Prince George's County. And it's second in the state, Highland Beach is the first one. North Brentwood was incorporated in 1924, she stated, under the leadership of the first mayor, who was Jeremiah Hawkins. Jeremiah Hawkins was raised in Brandywine, Maryland, but he came and settled in North Brentwood to spearhead the beginning development of a small town, which is, low, uh, which is North Brentwood. North Brentwood was founded by a Captain Bartlett who had soldiers in the Civil War. He had a uh, black soldiers and he had white soldiers. The, when he founded this land of Brentwood and North Brentwood, he gave the, the higher elevation land to the white soldiers and gave the lower level land that was prone to flooding to the black soldiers. So I remember very much myself being in North Brentwood. And I know, I know a lot of you know about the levee. The levee runs from Anacosta all the way to Mount Rainier. And, um, but that levee was not always there. So we, if we had a rain or bad uh, storm, a flood would occur. I remember going out in the boat because you had to get out in the boats because the water was coming in your home. So you had to get out in the boats. There were boats that everyone had and we got out in the boats and then we would wait until the water subsided out of, out, out of our home. So um, it had gotten so bad that our ancestors went to um, the county and demanded that they uh, put some type of levy system in. The levy system, most of the levy systems and the county were done by the Corps of Engineers. This one was done by um, um, WSSC. So that curtailed the flooding. And the home that I am in now is the same home that I was raised in. And it's also where my aunt instead, after a while, she got we got tired of she got tired of putting us in the boat. She opened up the attic. And the attic was opened up so we wouldn't have to go out in the boat. The water would come in the house, but we could go upstairs. And that's where we would have beds and we could lay down and rest. We had lanterns and um, maybe a few morsels of food until it was all over with. So that is a part of, of North Brentwood that would always stick in my mind because it takes everyone to uh, come out and do what is needed to tell whomever that you need certain uh, facilities, you need certain things, and that's what our ancestors were about in North Brentwood. So um, the uh, the holiday company once the once the flooding was the the name of the town was North Brentwood where the flooding occurred, but the upper upper part was Brentwood. So this was a town, this was a time when there were sundown towns. And um, Brentwood was a sundown town, and Mount Rainier was a sundown town. And you know DC was, was uh, segregated. So we were in the midst of that. So that's how we became to be North Brentwoodians and stay in our own little cocoons. Um, in, in 1928, and 1935, when Jeremiah Hawkins was serving, 
um, as the mayor, he also served um, and was asked to serve at the Republican National Convention. He was recognized as one of the outstanding Republic leaders in Maryland because he had great oratorical skills. Now, this is a known fact, and I don't know if a lot of you know, but most Blacks were registered as Republicans during that time. So um, even when I, I, I grew up and could, could register to vote, my parents told me, you have to re you register as a Republican. That's what we are. We are Republicans. But, and that's what we did. And we didn't find out till later on what, that we can make our own choices and, and, and do what we need to do, whether we want to be liberal or Democrats or whatever. The town of North Brook has had about, has had 13 mayors since its incorporation. And some serve more than the usual two year term, uh, tenure since there has been no implementation of term limits and there still isn't. Uh, recently, the election uh, terms have changed and it used to be two year terms, now they're four year terms. And I have served as mayor and, uh, since 2007, but as uh, she stated, I've also been a clerk and I've also been a council person. I've also wore some other hats in the community because I came back um, to this home to help my aunt when he, she was sick and uh, with my husband and to raise my children. So I've had other hats that I've had to wear as far as the different organizations in North Brentwood. As I remember North Brentwood growing up here at the tender age of three years old uh, with my great aunt, who was one of the entrepreneurs here. She's in, she's, uh, uh, she's in the Prince George's African American Museum Cultural Center um, display in North Brentwood. She was a seamstress and she was a beautician. Um, and she ran her own business at, 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 at her home and is the same home where I reside in today. Uh, and I, being returned here with my children, I had two children in that time in 1974. Um, I wanted to stay involved and make sure my children had a good life too. So um, there were other things I had to do. I was a president of the, of the North Brentwood Recreation Council and president of the Citizens Association. But there were also, when you talk about entrepreneurship in North Brentwood, there were numerous businesses in the town of North Brentwood. There were the ice man, we used to get the blocks of ice. You had the produce man, when you eat your produce, you know you had the bootlegger. Everybody had to have some liquor. <laughs> there was always a bootlegger somewhere. A lawyer, we had lawyers, we had doctors, a store, we had a barbershop, and definitely had a club. You had to have clubs. I remember stories about a white linen club that was uh, on road one, and of course, Sisters Tavern. Sisters Tavern was a juke joint, and um, that's where they partied at. They partied hard up in Sisters Tavern. But see, I was a teenager at that time, and they wouldn't allow me to come. I would come past there and hear the music, and it'd be jumping. But I couldn't get in there because there's no use of me going in there because by the time I got home, my mama, somebody would have told my mama that I was in that club. So, and that was, you know what happened then. So. But um, it was a vibrant place. What happened, you talked about Peril Bailey and Duke Ellington. Well, the stars that were uh, uh, performing at the Howard Theater, could they could perform there, but they couldn't stay in Washington, D.C. So they would come out to Sisters Tavern, which would they would have their own party. So that's where they could stay and relax and play music and sing and have a good time. So Sisters Tavern has some deep history. So um, uh, it, it really, really means a lot to the town. I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about it at, at the end of my presentation so that you can um, be able to um, come and see and be able to um, um, look it up and, and have some, and, and find some more information about it. My journey in North Greenwood, as I remember is school, there was a school here, North Brentwood Elementary School. This is one of the Rosenwald schools. A Rosenwald schools was the black schools that were in the county and they were for the black children. Um, this, this elementary school is at the, was at the 
site of the tennis courts now. It housed about 100 black students. Um, and it had first to second, first to sixth grades. Um, we had a we had a small black dedicated teachers who stressed to us. Our parents stressed, and our teachers stressed to us about the importance of education, and they wanted us to be educated. Education was most important. We enjoyed school. One of our favorite activities was just coming together and just learning from our teachers and, and doing different activities. But one of the activities that stands out is May Day. May Day was when, when all the boys dressed up in their suits and the girls dressed up in their white dresses and danced around the Maypole. It was not till 1961 integration was implemented and we were all sent to the all white school. And uh, we thought this would be kind of strange for us and it would be kind of strange for the white folks and uh, but it wasn't uh we as blacks were well versed we were well dressed we were smart we were great athletes and we had a lot of rhythm because you know we were dancing folks too but you know when we got to the school it's mount rainy elementary school the whites loved us because I guess what we had, we taught them a lot. They 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 liked the 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 beat, the joys joys we had, the joy that we had, and and found out that we weren't dumb. We were very well educated, and we dressed well. Uh, and then they had athletes. We had plenty of athletes. So most of the athletes from North Brunswick played on the basketball and football teams and led the schools to many victories. That got us real close as far as black and white children. We, as children, were all raised in, also raised in the church. We had to go to church. We had two churches in North Brentwood at that time, and they still exist, the AME, uh, American uh, Methodist Episcopal Church, and the First Baptist Church of North Brentwood. They still exist. They are, uh, First Baptist Church is in another location. It is on the, uh, uh, is across the street from the location of our town offices and where Gwendolyn Britt Senior Activity Center uh, is located. Growing up in North Brim was much, much fun. The population during my growing years was approximately 1,500. And that included a lot of children. We had a lot of children. Because of so many children, our parents presented to a county another plan that their youth, at their children, needed a place to play, uh, needed a place to gather. And we had a park, but they needed an inside place. They went to the county, and what happened is they built the North Brentwood Community Center, which is still there. It is a place of fun, activities, basketball, and spots of many of our town's town-sponsored events. We as Blacks were not allowed to go outside our boundaries in early ages. We didn't know that per se, but we knew that we were supposed to be in North Brent when we weren't supposed to go anywhere else. We didn't know why, but that was the rule. North Brentwood was surrounded by sundown towns, as I said, Brentwood and Mount Rainier and the, the segregated Washington, D.C., where the Blacks weren't allowed after um, sundown. Well, they could be beaten or worse. A barrier was placed at um, Wyndham Road, locations at 39th from Wyndham Road, is between the towns of Brentwood and the towns of North Brentwood. It was placed there by the town of Brentwood so that we would not be able to cross that barrier to come into their town. The barrier still stands. Through history of dedicated people like the Hawkins, all the mayors, elected and appointed officials, Reverend Jasper, one of the founding members of the Ch uh, First Baptist Church, Reverend Perry Smith, who served the church for 50 years, Miss Anna Holmes, who was the historian of North Brentwood, Mr. Clarence Wallace, who was the store owner, because we could get anything at our store. We could, he would go over to the market in DC and pick up um, all sorts of fresh foods, fresh vegetables, and we would, and our parents would send us up there to get it. They, and, and sometimes if they didn't have money, they were, they ran tabs, so they would they would pay them at, at the first of the month. 
We also had, I know maybe some of y'all heard Mayor Lillian, ba Lillian Beverly. She's our first woman mayor and my mentor. Um, Ms. Eleanor Trainum, who was an encyclopedia, walking encyclopedia. Ms. Eleanor Nance, 80, 86, and Mayor Beverly is 92, still living. And they were members of established organizations such as the North Brooklyn Recreation Council, Historic, Historical Society, Citizens Association, and all the dedicated parents who were determined that their children were going to be well-rounded and an asset to any community or organization to improve relationship with all people. Presently, the towns of Brentwood and North Brentwood, with the help of the Neighborhood Design Center, have collaborated to memorialize the history around the barrier. An artist has been selected and a new art creation will help tell the story about segregation. The barrier will not come down. We need to remember what the barrier is, was about. And future Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission will come on board to place signage in the area. But we, we know, we talked about bringing it, taking it down, but it cannot work like that. We all decided the barrier is a part of history and should not be removed and be able to tell the story for years to come. Joe's Emporium in Mount Rainier has uh, sponsored many events around the Historic Sisters Tavern. Uh, there's an ad ad adaptation that has been written by playwright Doug Robinson, no kin to me, and uh, Alley Theater that was presented um, two years ago, and um, it probably was still run if it wasn't for COVID at Joe's. Today, the town is near completion of the Juke Joints, formerly Sisters Tavern, where Pearl Belly and other stars came at the stints of the Howard Theater, where they could not stay. But now the town has purchased the, the property, which is going to be used as a community resource facility and uh, rental space. This venue is small. It can hold up to about 78 persons, but we look forward to using it also for uh, many musical experiences in the Gateway Arts District. The town has also purchased a lot next door and working on an outdoor pavilion that can enhance Sisters Tavern and can also be used as a musical outdoor facility. At this point, we're working with Neighborhood Design Center and we're working with the Prince George's Arts and Humanities Council on both projects. I'm going to leave you with some sites to uh, get more information about North Brentwood. Uh, one of them is the town site. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, other one is, um, I know um, Chanel has that on, um, in her, in her uh, report, Prince George African American Museum, The Digital Footsteps. Um, the North Brentwood Historical Society also has and has uh, is instrumental in publishing two books about the town, Footsteps of North Brentwood. It tells the, the detailed story of the town and Mining Our, Bo Our Business, story of over 100 entrepreneurs in North Brentwood. The cost of these books is $10.60 each and the proceeds go to the North Brentwood Historical Society. So if interested, contact our town office and we will make sure that you get that. But I'll put that information uh, in, the, in the chat to uh, the number to contact the uh, offices. But North Brentwood has been a joy to me and North Brentwood is, it has changed a lot and people who've, who've been here our theme last year was I am North, I mean, our theme in the 95th anniversary, which was uh, a couple of years ago, was I am North Brentwood. So, um, and people are proud to be a part of North Brentwood. The growing up and the family structure was just immensely rewarding to all of us. So I hope you'll come and just uh, we have a lot of people coming and just walk around North Brentwood. Just come and walk around North Brentwood and visit us. But if you need any more information, you know how to get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Robinson. Really appreciate your, your talk. And I'm sure there will be questions afterwards for you. But why don't we move right now to Chanel Compton, um, who uh, with the Prince George's African American Museum, the board chair, and um, with the State Museum, the Banneker, Douglas Museum. Ms. Compton. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and thank you, esteemed guests, and to 
um, Mayor Robinson for her vision and dedication and partnership with the Prince George's African American Museum. I do want to recognize one of our board members, the Honorable Candace Hollingsworth, who's joining us today, and to the Center for Aging in Hyattsville. Thank you so much for, for this invitation. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and I'll be giving a short presentation about the history of uh, the mission, history and vision of the Prince George's African American Museum and Cultural Center, um, sharing with you some of our future plans and upcoming events. So just yeah. give me a yeah. thumbs up if you That's see the screen. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the Prince George's African American Museum, uh, our mission is to celebrate and inspire the community through the cultivation, preservation, and presentation of the cultural and artistic contributions of African Americans in Prince George's County, Maryland, and beyond. Uh, we are located at 4519 Rhode Island Avenue on Route 1 in the heart of the Gateway Arts District in the historic town of North Brentwood. Uh, you can definitely visit our website at www.pgaamcc.org where you can learn more about our events. We have a really great um, virtual exhibition series as well as a digital collection, um, I'm sorry, digital Yes, digital collection of uh, our uh, permanent exhibit. So a little bit about our programs. Um, I just read to you our mission and how we activate our mission is through our key services. So we have a collection and archives program, uh, most of which is, is being digitized. We have uh, temporary exhibitions all year long. Uh, we have lecture in, as well as a permanent exhibit, uh, Footsteps North Brentwood. We have host lectures, panel discussions. Uh, we have a great early childhood program. Uh, we do after school programs, public art and festivals and so much more. Uh, so we are a museum without walls. We do a tremendous amount of outreach throughout the county uh, as well as host dynamic events on site uh, annually, we serve about 12,000 visitors per year uh, and through our education outreach programs, 3,500, around 3,500 youth per year. Uh, of course, due to COVID-19, we had to close temporarily to the public, uh, but we did ha successfully have pivoted to do, to host uh, virtual uh, programs for the public. Um, today, we just, um, completed a really great virtual presentation on Afro-Native history in Prince George's County, which was fantastic. Um, coming up, we will, uh, we are partnering with uh, PGCPS, Prince George's County Public Schools, where we'll be hosting uh, vir virtual heritage tours uh, for students to explore Black history in their towns. Uh, and students will be invited to design African-American monuments and memorials for their towns um, which will premiere on our website as a virtual youth exhibit. So we're super excited about that. We're also partnering with the Prince George's Lynch, Lynching and Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, where they will be leading uh, discussions, virtual discussions on those top Prince George's County lynchings and the history of lynchings in Prince George's County with students at Suitland High School and uh, Northwestern High School. So though we are close to the public, we, are he we have heavily active online uh, and we look forward to opening in the near future. So how we got started. It all started, well, I'm just going to piggyback off of uh, Mayor Robinson. She spoke briefly about this with the North Brentwood Historical Society, which was formed in 1991. Um, that historical society, um, which was a group of fearless, uh, um, North Brentwood residents uh, commissioned an exhibition entitled Footsteps of North Brentwood, um, which chronicled the history um, of the founding of North Brentwood when the land was first purchased in 1891, all the way to 
uh, post-World World War II years. Um, so the exhibition was um, a re relatively small exhibition and it uh, was premiered at the Anacostia uh, Community Museum, Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum in Washington, DC. So some of the things that you will find in the exhibition, um, which is currently on permanent display at the museum, uh, and forgive me for some of the photos are not as high res as I would have liked, but bear with me. Um, and so uh, in some of the things that you'll see in the exhibition uh, is, um, of course, the history of the North Brentwood Elementary School, which was a Rosenwald school. And that really, if you don't know, the Rosenwald schools were, was a fund um, that was initiated by, funded um, partially by Julius Rosenwald, who owned um, Sears Company. Um, he was um, uh, swayed by Booker T. Washington uh, to fund, uh, partially fund, African American schoolhouse in the Deep South because of segregation. Um, black students didn't have access to um, proper, proper school facilities. Uh, so North Brentwood um, uh, being an example of uh, African American communities investing in their children um, during deep segregation. Uh, so really great story. Uh, uh, some other things that you'll find in the exhibit is the history of the Plummer family. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Plummer family is a historic family and of course in North Brentwood and, and but in, in Prince George's County in general. Um, in this photo on the left hand side you see the dapper gentleman sitting down that is uh, Nicholas Plummer and he was the son of Adam Francis Plummer who was enslaved in Riversdale and uh, he was married to Nellie Plummer who was enslaved on Three Sisters Plantation and if there was ever a movie to be done about Black history in Prince George's County, I mean, this, this is it. Um, um, Adam Francis Plummer knew how to read and write. Um, and during enslavement, his family was sold throughout the South, all the way to New Orleans. So post-emancipation, um, the way in which many, I mean, that was the first thing African-Americans did who were enslaved was locate their family. Um, since his children and himself were literate, they wrote letters and they were able to find each other and they settled um, in the Hyattsville area and they were early settlers. The family was also early settlers in North Brentwood. Um, so just a, a, a really um, tremendous story. Uh, in the exhibition, it ex uh, explores town leadership and activism. Uh, mayor Robinson mentioned um, the first mayor uh, of North Brentwood, Mayor Jeremiah Hawkins. He was an entrepreneur, a real estate developer, an incredible orator, uh, and it also explores um, the first African-American woman uh, mayor of North Brentwood, Lillian K. Beverly, who is one of the museum's um, founders. Really, she was the lead founder for the Prince George's African American Museum. The Historical Society took a great part um, in uh, establishing the museum, but it was really under the leadership and the fearlessness. And if y'all don't know Mayor Beverly, when she says she's going to get something done, she gets it done. So she, um, because of the success of this exhibition, they leveraged that success. She did leveraged that success and they advocated, uh, Mayor Beverly advocated to um, state legislators um, and under her leadership advocated to county legislators to fund what would be the Prince George's African American Museum. So from that small vision, that small exhibition, that was let the ground swell um, to serve thousands of, to share the history of Prince George's to share Prince George's Black history to thousands of, of residents and tourists in, in the county every year. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of youth programming. Um, and if you ask many um, um, 
community leaders and educators that founded African American museums because right around like the 1980s to early 2000s, there was a surge of African American museums that were being established throughout the country. Um, North Brentwood, of course, being a part of that Black museum movement. If you ask the early founders, who many of which were civil rights leaders, were activists, were educators, um, were town leaders such as Mayor Robinson, if you ask them, why, why are you forming this African American museum? Um, the first thing that they would probably say, and, and many founders have said, um, is to educate the next generation, uh, to combat systems of racism, to empower communities, to empower Black communities through the preservation and celebration of Black history. Because Black history is a relatively new phenomenon. It wasn't popularized until um, uh, the later part of, of the 20th century. So, uh, so here we are, here we are today. So our vision, we have a relatively small facility and our collection, our programming uh, is growing. So we received a, a capital grant from the African American um, Preservation, Heritage Preservation Grant um, for pre-development, as well as a state capital grant, uh, a larger state capital grant to start pre-development on our much needed building expansion. Uh, this will expand our museum space to hold and preserve our collections, to do a, a, um, larger educational programming uh, and events and exhibitions. Uh, we'll also be um, uh, building an artist in residency um, housing facility that will be a part of the museum that will only cultivate um, the, the arts community, further cultivate the arts community in the Gateway Arts District. Uh, so we're incredibly excited about that. Um, this facility um, is being designed in partnership with the Neighborhood Design Center. Um, they developed a, an incredible, um, well, not just, well, they developed an incredible feasibility study where community members um, were actually, uh, Prince Georgians were actually surveyed on what they wanted to see uh, in this facility. So um, this design is an outcome to that. We're also partnering with um, the town of North Brentwood on their heritage site, which is Sissy's Tavern. We'll be doing some programming in that facility. Um, we're in incredibly excited about that. On the left-hand side is a historic photo that I just love um, of, of Sissy's Tavern um, when it was um, opened. I believe that it was opened as a convenience store bar. It went through a lot of reiterations, but that's that's a historic photo. I see Mayor Robinson nodding, so. All right, some resources, just, just to get your feet wet, all right? We have some really great resources online. I'll be happy to put it in the chat. If you really just want to start and learn about um, the many Black incorporated and unincorporated townships in Prince George's County, um, 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 Maryland Parks um, in Maryland Park Service has a really great catalog, online catalog that's free to the public um, that you can download. Um, also, if you visit the Prince George's uh, um, African American Museum website, uh, we have a digital, we digitize the Footsteps of North Brentwood collection. We also have really, really great um, virtual tours of our other exhibitions as well. They're about three to four minutes, but they're really great for the entire family to enjoy. Um, if you want to lo learn the history of uh, Hyattsville, um, particularly they have a really great archives on um, the desegregation of schools um, in the Hyattsville area and in Prince George's County, um, visit the Hyattsville uh, library. Um, you can also follow the museum on social media, on Facebook, or in, on Instagram, we're highly active. We do repost all of our virtual programming uh, and we, um, throughout the year, we have really interesting pop quizzes, um, Black history pop quizzes focusing on Prince George's County. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. 
if you wish to donate or contribute, of course, you can go to our web website and make a donation. And thank you. I am going to kick it back over to Lisa. Uh, actually, you're going to kick it over to Loretta. Um, I'm going to kick it over to Loretta. Okay. Um, thank right. you so much. Do you want to stop the? Oh, oh one more, more thing. One yeah. more thing. Okay. One more thing. Oh my goodness. All right. This is the same shameless plug, but it's, it's, she's, she's worth it. So uh, Harriet Tubman Day is March 10th. Uh, we have um, Maya Davis. She is a legislative liaison and archivist at, um, well, former of Maryland State Archives. She will be the new executive director at the Riversdale House Museum, where Adam Francis Plummer was once enslaved. Uh, Maya is an incredible scholar, and she will be leading a, dis a virtual discussion with the museum on Harriet Tubman Day, March 10th. So definitely stay tuned for that. Thank you so much to Ms. Compton and to Mayor Robinson. There are, yes, let's applaud Zoom style. Uh, there are some questions that have been sent in the chat. So let me start with those and keep them coming. Mayor Robinson, some of our uh, attendees may not know what sundown towns were. Could you explain that, please? Oh, you need, to, yeah, let's unmute you. There you go. Okay. Um, uh, sundown towns, uh, or sometimes they call them great towns. Sundown towns are towns where all white, uh, was white municipalities or neighborhoods um, in the United States that practice a form of racial segregation by excluding non-whites via uh, combination, some combination of discriminatory discriminatory local laws. So if you, if the sun went down and you were not supposed to, uh, non-whites were not supposed to be in their neighborhoods. And if they were in their neighborhoods, uh, you may you may find them beat, beat up somewhere. Uh, it even could be worse of lynching, okay? But um, one of the, um, one of the performances at Joe's Emporium uh, and the adaptation that Doug Robinson did is a perfect example because the plot is that uh, a guy named, I'm gonna say Peter, Peter was supposed to be at the juke joint, but Peter, he didn't come into work and it was nighttime. Everybody wants to know where Peter is. Peter, they said, we well, hope Peter is not over there in Brentwood because they will kill them. They, he, they will lynch, lynch him. So that was part of um, the adaptation that Doug uh, Robinson do to bring out sundown towns. So it was excluding non-whites. So you weren't supposed to be in their towns. And if you were in their town, you were in violation. Uh, Robert Crossland, you want to add to that? I do want to add to that. Um, in, uh, I just want to, want to say that uh, in, in sundown towns, if you were African-American, you could go to work there, but when the sun went down, you had to be out of the town, mm -hmm. okay? That's, that's primarily what it was about. You could not be in the town after sundown, but you can go there during the day. Uh, if you had a job there, if you're working in someone's home, for instance, you were allowed to do that, but you had to be out of town by sundown. Uh, okay, thank you, and uh, Mayor Hollingsworth. Candace, please. <laughs> and um, I guess the other thing I would add to that is it's important to acknowledge or at least remember that many um, law enforcement agencies in communities around the country and even in Prince George's County originated because of the um, requirement to enforce these formal and informal laws around sundown towns. And I don't know which of you at this point wants to uh, answer. I guess we'll turn to our, our speakers first. But so what were the relationships like before this, before sunset? You, you talked about somebody could be working in Brentwood or Hyattsville. Um, I can't imagine it was super comfortable if, what was it like, I guess? Yes, Robert Crosland. Well, let me just say that uh, my grandmother was a domestic. 
and her job was to go in was obviously to to uh, to do the housework and to cook in for the, for white families okay and they had she had to have all that prepared before the sun went down and then um she had to leave Mayor Robinson, do you want to add to that? Well, I know my my grand my great uncle. He was a bricklayer, um, and there were buildings he could work on those construction buildings, um, and and be a bricklayer in a white neighborhood. But uh, as they said, uh, when that he had to be out of there by sunday sun Sunday sundown, and you know the pay. You know what the pay was like. I mean, bricklayers probably made a little bit more than other laborers did, but um, I, and I don't know what that was. But I mean, it was minimum. But um, the same story. They had to be out of these towns. You could work there, and there was no the great relationship because they could because you could be a domestic person and, and you were good at it. You could be a carpenter or a bricklayer and you were good at it because most black men were carpenters and, and bricklayers and cement finishers and things like that. They were good at it. Uh, and they were just there to make their money and to get out of town. Anyone else want to add to that? Thanks, Sarah. Who's this? Sarah. Sarah, you need to unmute, Sarah. There you yes, go. yes. Uh, James Lowen, L-O-E-W-E-N, has written a book called Sundown Towns. And so that's something that people can uh, look up. He actually was still living in Washington, D.C., I believe. And uh, years back at, in my government job, we had him speak at at our agency for Black American uh, History Month. So that's something to, to look into. Okay, thank you, thank you. Mayor Robinson, how do you remember uh, early Hyattsville from your growing up days? I wasn't in Hyattsville. Did you visit or travel there? <laughs> no. Off Hyattsville? No. <laughs> I didn't travel to high school. We may have walked. We walked through Mount Rainier and we went to Northwestern, but we didn't do, do a lot of traveling in Hinesville. Um, If anything, when, when I had gotten to the age, we could go to other black communities, say like College Park, Lakeland, you know, Lakeland College. So we could go to other communities where they had little dances and things like that. We had dances in our own community. Um, when we were in Northwestern High School, the, the we were proms we did go to proms but um we did it, it wasn't no hanging out in Hyattsville it, we just didn't we just did not do that uh, I also want to say because it was just brought to it was brought to my attention a while back we were um uh, when we went to Northwestern High School we had never been around smoking cigarettes I'm talking about smoking cigarettes but we learned how to smoke cigarettes at Northwestern High School. <laughs> I mean, that was because they had a smoking hole. We didn't know what a smoking hole was. <laughs> and they had this smoking hole. And, you know, uh, you know, we, we were the minority because we, we, we were the first ones to come and to integrate uh, Northwestern. But we wondered what they doing in that, 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 that place back there. And our parents got on us when we I said we were in we tried smoking in the smoking hole with the, and our parents you do not smoke so don't start that you know don't and it was a habit that we we never we never adapt you know it, it was never brought to our our home um and I'm not saying pe people didn't smoke let me say that black people smoke too but it was something that we did not do as as, as young um, children, I mean, as young adults, we did not do that. But that's when we we, we learned about smoking. Can you imagine that? We never knew no about smoking. All right, thank you. Uh, I see a couple of raised hands. I don't know if they weren't lowered or if they're still, you want to make comments. Robert, 
Roslyn? Well, I like to say that um, back in my college days, a couple of years ago, uh, <laughs> I, had a girl, I had a girlfriend who uh, went to the University of Maryland. And I used to come down from Baltimore to visit her on the weekend. And I recall being told never to get caught in Hyattsville. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, that was the place. If you were black, you did not want to go to Hyattsville. So it's amazing now that I live in Hyattsville. Times <laughs> <laughs> have changed as slow as it is. Lisa, no, I have a, yeah, Lisa, go ahead. I have a question. Um, I, so the town was, North Brentwood was founded in, um, uh, in the 1880s, um, around the same time that I think uh, Hyattsville was founded as well. Um, but it didn't incorporate until 1924. And one of the things that I was told, and I do not know whether it's true, was that um, that Brentwood had, this town of Brentwood had turned down incorporation three times because it didn't want North Brentwood incorporated with it. Is that, I heard that. It, is that accurate? I heard it. I, I, I heard that too. I have not seen, you know, we went through some books, some old records and mm -hmm. things like that. But, uh, you know, as far as meetings and man town council's meetings and stuff that they had a long time ago, we did, I, I've heard it before through Miss Trainer, who is our uh, encyclopedia, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. they did, they, you know, didn't want to do this, but I heard it through her. And I don't know if it's written anywhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know either, and yeah, I do know I more it. research. I don't know, um, Miss Compton, whether you whether you know anything more about that, or whether no. you could point well, us to some people that might know. Well, the land was sold to the Randalls family in 1891. Yeah. Um, and so when they incorporated, I mean, they were known as Randallstown until they incorporated yes. as North Brentwood. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Um, I, that all of that sounds plausible, but we don't have any documentation to in our collections to, to, to validate that. But it all sounds plausible. So I, as you mentioned earlier, and I'm just jumping in here, Loretta, I'm sorry, but I, you mentioned earlier about the, um, the lynching commission, and I also uh, sat in on a meeting last, uh, earlier this week uh, of the, with somebody speaking about it. I wonder if you could say something more about that and about what uh, what it's what it's doing. So yeah, the 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 lynching. The, well, there's the the Maryland State um, Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and that that is a state governor appointed commission. Mm -hmm. The Prince George's um, um, Commission is working under that state commission to mm -hmm. basically. Um, do uh, conduct research on um, lynching victims. I believe there were four documented in Prince George's County, and I can put their the web their their website in in the chat. Um, and so what they're doing is they are organizing soil samples um, of the sites where the lynchings took place that will be um, put in uh, jars and mailed to um, uh, the National Lynching Museum in, I believe it's in Mississippi, I should know this, it's Mississippi. Um, and so, um, but this is going on all across the state and this is the first commission, state commission of its kind, so it is a, a national model. Uh, so the Prince George's is working with them, with the Prince, the Prince George's Museum is working with the Prince George's Lynching Committee commission, excuse me, um, to organize the first round of a youth education uh, programming in the county. Mm -hmm. And it's not specifically an only lynching, it's any um, uh, death that occurred or, or serious harm that occurred as a result of violence. Is that, isn't that right? In the way it's pretty, it's, well, so the, it's, that's, that's a good question. So with, within that particular commission, there is, you know, um, definitely um, intersections and uh, conversations around police brutality and um, uh, racial violence, mm -hmm. um, but they are being very specific to um, document and uncover public 
lynchings that occurred in the county. Wow. Okay. Are the hands that are raised related to the topic of lynching? Okay, Sandra. So I posted in the chat and um, Carter Ross was kind enough to, I couldn't post to everybody. I put up two links. One is to the PG County Lynching Commission. The other is to the State of Maryland Lynching Project, which is a separate organization. Um, there are two short documentaries out. One is about the three documented Maryland lynchings. Um, it was just film. It was just um, shown maybe two weeks ago. Um, and I'm not sure I, you'd have to go to their website to see if there are any more um, showings um, scheduled. And um, there was a short, also a short documentary about a lynching on the Eastern Shore. Um, and so the, the Maryland Lynching Project is going ahead with a lot of wonderful work on the score. And Chanel, uh, you want, go ahead. I do want to uh, note that a part of their work as well um, um, is to organize um, um, truth and reconciliation. They're not trials, but basically uh, public events where um, the victims' families, mm -hmm. as well as I, and I don't believe, but the 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 people that family members that were related to the murderers of of the victims. Um, so kind of like in the same vein how um, South Africa had the truth and reconciliation trial, so to speak, um, the lynching commission will be organizing those as well. Wow. wow. And Sarah, you had, you had your hand up also. Thank you for that. Okay, so I'm part of the Prince George's County Lynching Memorial Project and uh, Tonight, if you go on their website, they'll have a link, which is at seven o'clock. They're gonna have Dennis Duster and Ernest Quarles talk about, I don't have the whole title, but it's about what happened on uh, the events of January 6th and how it relates to lynching. And the other thing about the commission is, the project is that the, the effects of the lynching have gone through generation after generation after generation. And that's why the police brutality aspect um, goes uh, into this lynching um, stuff. Um, also, the, um, the lynching memorial that Oh, I'm going to blank on his name. Brian. Um, Stevenson. Brian Stevenson. It's the yes, Eastern Brian Justice Initiative. Stevenson. Yes, that's in um, Montgomery, Alabama. And right, that, that's okay, Chanel. Whatever. <laughs> and, and that's okay. And so um, we're hoping that we got, I think we got... Um, to be put under, we put an um, application in to be put under the Equal Justice Initiative of, of Brian Stevenson's thing, so that when we do soil collection, we'll be able to have it down in uh, at the uh, museum in Alabama. And when we do soil collection, we would love to have it public and have students involved in the collection and have um, you know a big presentation about it. So hopefully we can do it uh, after COVID so we can do something. That's it. Uh, let's see, we have questions not related to lynching. So I think I'm gonna have Sandra have the last word. No, oh, you lowered your hand, okay. Yeah, I was gonna talk about the EJI, but it, since it got covered. Okay, um, Chanel, you mentioned Riversdale as um, having enslaved people there. Could you say more about that? Oh, you're muted. 
I can speak specifically on the Plummer family. Okay. Um, so Adams Francis Plummer um, was a farmer and he was a, um, a servant to um, the son of the homeowner. And um, if you visit the Riversdale House Museum, um, they recreated um, the home of Adam Francis Plummer with um, replicas of his belongings and, uh, and so forth. So I'm really excited uh, that Maya Davis uh, will be the executive director uh, because her vision is to um, expand the narrative of Adam Fr Francis Plummer and his role uh, at, at the home, as well as the other um, African Americans that, that were enslaved at the home as well. Thank you. Lisa, you're raising your hand. Yeah, I'm, uh, first on, um, just on, to follow up on that, you indicated, um, Chanel, when you spoke first about the Plummer family, that his wife was in service to another family elsewhere, correct? So that it's an example of the families being very split up. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and every, it, it was documented that every weekend, um, Adam Francis Plummer would walk eight miles plus to see his wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just mm. such a tremendous story. Mm. Where was she, when, where was she? Uh, she was located in the Three Sisters Plantation. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look up where that is. I don't know where yeah. that is. Yeah. That's okay. We can look that up. I, I think, in, I'm sorry. It's in uh, Annapolis. It's in Annapolis. Wow. Um, I, I do have another question, and really it is um, is to ask you about your, the work at the State Museum at Banneker Douglas, um, particularly. It's a, it's a gorgeous facility, and I know that as the executive director, you're involved in a lot of programs there. Could you just talk to us a little bit about what the, the State Museum is doing? You're muted again. Uh, the Banneker Douglas Museum, we're located in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, and right now we are temporarily closed, but um, like the Prince George's African American Museum, we've pivoted to uh, do virtual programming. Uh, this year, um, our theme is African Americans in the family, so we'll be hosting monthly programming around that topic. Um, um, and uh, uh, we have a really great community partnerships where um, we uh, are exhibiting a group exhibition um, featuring Black artists in Maryland around the topic of Black Lives Matter. Uh, we have um, initiated an anti-racism coalition uh, where uh, coalition members are um, curating a series of anti-racism uh, community trainings uh, that will premiere in April of this year. Great. Thank you. There are a few questions that have come in asking uh, where Black people were living. So we know North Brentwood, Mount Rainier, Lakeland, and how they got between those towns to visit one another. Um, to get to work? Were there so-called underground railroads between the communities? I want to back up really quick. I'm sorry. Three Sisters Plantation, I had a brain freeze, um, is in west of Bel Air in Prince George's County. Mm. Huh. Okay. okay, should I repeat the question? Or so we're getting the sense that Black people were living in Mount Rainier, North Brentwood, Lakeland, maybe tell us where else they lived, but how did they travel between those communities or to work or, and somebody's asking were there so any kind of underground railroads uh, going through those towns or anywhere in the, in the area? Sure. Um... Well, I mean, the B&L Railroad ran through many of those towns and North Brentwood even had a trolley system 
So that was a, the BNO was actually a huge draw for African Americans to um, settle in towns such as, you know, Lakeland and, and uh, North Brentwood. So that's how, if we're, we're talking about 20th century, that's how people uh, typically got around. Um, as far as the underground uh, network for freedom sites, um, I can't recall any formal sites off of hand, but um, I'm happy to um, do a little digging and share that research um, um, via email at a later time. Mayor Robinson, do you, go ahead. Um, well, I could just say about North Brentwood, uh, North Brentwood being a, a place where there were many entrepreneurs, a lot of people in North Brentwood had their businesses at home. Mm -hmm. They would, they may have a truck, the produce man may have a truck, and he may go through different towns to, to, to sell his <laughs> goods, but uh, beauticians, lawyers, doctors, the barber shop, all that here, it was located in the town of North Brentwood. So a lot of, uh, of things that they did were on a barter scale. You know, you barter services. Mm -hmm. You know, you do my hair, then you can cut my son's hair. I used to take my sons up to the barbershop because the barbershop had, you know, when I first came, my, that was in 1970, 1972. So I'm saying I take it to, to the barbershop. Most of the men were sitting in the barbershop waiting for, the, for a free chair. So I'm saying they weren't, they stayed in North Rome, they stayed more among themselves because they were seamstress. They were beauticians. They were barbers. The places were here. They were store owners. You know, um, you get a meal. They were all here in North Brentwood. So it was more of an entrepreneur town because you just had to go certain places. The bootlegger, the bootlegger was up the street. You could find the bootleg. You know, I'm just saying this is what they did and they came together to do that. And so that's how they made their money. And, and I'll have to say, I know my great aunt, um, uh, she she uh, studied under Madam Madam C J Walker, and she opened up her beauty parlor on the side porch of my home. And um, she would have one customer on the outside. You finish that customer, and she, you know, they, don't, you know, now they do salons. Well, I guess they don't do it now because of COVID. But I mean, used to be in a salon, you know, two or three people. But uh, and she'd work had. Uh, maybe half the evening to get off about seven o'clock and then at eight I, I was shocked to see they have a man town council meeting at nine o'clock at night mm -hmm. and we where, where will we be at nine o'clock at night i mean unless we're already in the meeting but i'm saying they wouldn't start the meeting at nine o'clock at night that's because people were working and doing what they needed to do to provide for their families during those early hours and at nine o'clock was when they would come to get, they finished everything, they would come together and let's talk about the business of the town. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, they were just secluded. And then as far as Lakeland is concerned, cause they had to sell, like Chanel said, they had the little subway system or whatever like that. Um, but um, some people had cars. I mean, some people about my peers had cars so we could drive up route one and go to the juke joint and drive back. So I'm just saying we didn't have a lot of, it was not a lot of movement. Okay. okay. You did certain places, but you weren't doing a whole lot of, but we thought we were moving and let's get that straight. <laughs> and we okay. thought we were really moving, you know. So we I, I do, I do have to, I, um, forgive me, um, I have to prepare for another presentation. Mm -hmm. Black History Month is incredibly busy. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to thank you so much, Lisa, for um, organ and your team for organizing this event. And it's always wonderful, even virtually, to see Mayor Robinson. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone, please be safe and um, thank you, enjoy Julie. the rest of Black History Month. <laughs> and thank have you. a wonderful so Women's History Month. Thank you. Right. Thank, you. thank you. We'll so see you on your, on, you website, on your museum site. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about the War Memorial Park of North Brentwood. Could you tell us something about that? 
the Bo Memorial Park was, um, it was a grant because that park belonged, the, the, the land belonged to the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. And I think it was done, I don't know the exact date, but I think at that time I may have been the clerk and I was under the leadership of Mayor Lillian K. Beverly. She was the one that implemented the Memorial uh, Park. That, that um, space was given to us it's on Allison Street. That space was given to us to an open space grant. Um, the North Berwyn Historical Society was involved immensely. Um, it is a monument that has names of all of the previous, all the way back to Civil War time, the previous um, and, the, and, and, the, and the other residents of the town of North Berwyn who served in any kind of war. Mm -hmm. um, and there are over 250 names on that monument. There was also pavers, brick pavers that were purchased um, through different families, even though where they were deceased, uh, so that they would have their day uh, uh, on a paver. So that area is um, still there. It is a, a grand um, monument, the Marble Company. And I think that's in um, Brentwood. The Marble Company across from Thomas Stone Elementary. I think that side is Brentwood. Brent, they did the, the marble and the creation of the, the monument itself. We just installed a new flagpole. Uh, uh, the flag was getting caught up in the trees. And so we got a higher and it looks magnificent. And we each year, uh, we each year uh, uh, on uh, May 30th have a Memorial Day, have a service um, to recognize um, our veterans and a roll call. Um, John, uh, I tell you, a, a, a mine is a terrible thing to worry. John Seaburn, his name is John Seaburn is one of the black soldiers that is listed on the Peace Cross. He's the only huh. black soldier that's listed on the Peace Cross. His name is John Seaburn, and he is from now from from North Brentwood, and he is on our monument. But he is on the only black soldier at um, Peace Cross huh. Monument. Very nice, very nice. Okay, thank you for that. I think um, the last question that I've seen here goes back to the sundown laws. Uh, if you know when they were revoked and wondering about the transition, like did, did black people feel comfortable staying out past, uh, was it sunset, whatever sunset was or a different time or uh, was it, were they still feeling like they needed to go right back to Lakeland or North Brentwood? Um, so if you know I... when they were revoked and the transition after that. I'm, I'm sure I, you know, I wasn't there having that, did a lot of research on it. Um, we, and I was born in 1950. So, um, and as a child, you know, as a child, you don't, um, well, as a child, they didn't tell you much, they didn't tell you much anyway. That's number one. As a child, they, it wasn't none of your business, whatever it was, whatever they was doing or whatever you could not do, you couldn't ask no questions. Why? <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't, they say none of your business. So you just go on and do what I tell you to do. I just believe that through through uh, integration and, and the civil rights movement, I think things moved a little bit faster as far as the sundown towns. Okay. It had to be. It had to be through the civil rights movement coming coming through and the and the and the integration of schools that all this finally just dwindled down. We just did what we were told to do. Don't go there. Well, and maybe your families were trying to spare the children from... They did because we didn't... I, I'm going to tell you, as I was growing up, I didn't know nothing. I, I never seen a, a white and black um, water fountain. Hmm. I seen that on a picture of the TV. Hmm. I've never seen it. They protected us. They didn't tell us a whole bunch. They didn't tell us about nothing. They didn't tell us about anything. They didn't. If they was, I, you know, I like to put fun and laughter and everything. If, if you was going for, if, if you was with your mom to go to bootleg, you had no business knowing what she going to bootlegger for. 
<laughs> you had no business knowing what he was doing. I'm just saying they did not. They did not tell us nothing. That did. Yeah. They kept us protected from everything. We just did not know what we were going through. We were just playing and having fun. Okay. Actually, there was another question. Is there a second church in North Brentwood aside from the African Methodist? Uh, yeah, there's the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and there is the um, First Baptist Church of North Brentwood. Okay. That's the Baptist Church and the St. James. Uh, and then there, there is another, St. James. Pentecostal church. They may have come in 1970 or something like that, but there are three churches now. But uh, the AME Zion Church was the first one incorporated um, and, um, and it still is at the same site. And then, um, uh, then the First Baptist Church of North Brentwood came in second. Um, I don't know if you, uh, I don't know where anybody lives at but I do know that on the community channel, on our community channel, which you might get, um, 71 is Comcast. Town of North Brewing is set, Comcast is, is 71. Verizon is 1983. There is a story. We did an I Am North Brentwood story. And there's a story on our community channel to tell you about the history, which also involves the churches, the, uh, the settlers, um, so if you have time, that, um, I'll put it in here, the Comcast channel is 71 and Verizon is 1983. Okay, great. Lisa. So Loretta, are there, do you see more questions? I don't, no. Are there any last questions from? Anybody else got their hand up? Want to ask a question? I, so if you download the chat, folks, you can um, get those, that'll go right to your computer and we will send some of those out, some of those references out when we're finished. Um, ooh, Mayor Robinson put that to me. I guess we- I'm sorry. Yeah. That's all right, I can send it to the- Okay. Whole. And if you don't uh, know how to save the chat, if you uh, click on the chat box, and you'll see there should, it should say file and then you have the option of where to save the chat to like your computer or uh, Dropbox, Google Drive, etc. Okay, there's the Comcast channel 71 and Verizon. So if there aren't more questions, I really want to thank uh, Mayor Robinson for joining us today. Um, and and uh, Chanel Compton in even though she's already left. I think it was a very interesting um, uh, event and one that I know people when they signed up for this said they wanted to know more about local history. So the planners here will look into that and see whether there's some things that we can do on the other towns, including, I think, um, uh, so I don't know whether it's District Heights. There are other towns that were established as, as African American communities as well. Um, Fairmont so Heights. Fairmont Heights. Glenard, Glenard, Fairmont and Heights, Eagle Harbor, Eagle Harbor, and North Brentwood were the first four right. incorporated. Prince George African American Museum did a an exhibit right. with them. Those four um, four so towns: Eagle Harbor, North Brentwood, Glenard, and Fairmont Heights. So we may let, let's not have... back away from Hyattsville story. Thank you. No. Yes. No, we won't. We, there are things. If people have raised questions actually about the high, about Hyattsville's current um, investigations of its codicils and the fact that you know the park is was supposed to be for whites only when it was originally established. Um, that report that the CDC is involved with um, is coming out later this year, and we thought we might do something on that when it comes out. But there's more there, and I'd like to follow up on what. Um, um, Mayor Candace, what Candace had to say about the establishment of police departments as well. I think that would be interesting. Yes, ma'am. I think Hyattsville also, because I we've run through some stories and Stuart Eisenberg has been instrumental. He's before the Hyattsville CDC um, in letting us know uh, there was a Blacks could not buy in, could buy could not buy houses in North, in the Hyattsville. I'm sorry, in Hyattsville. Yeah. It could there not are many, be many places many. that were that had actually things yeah. in their records. 
It also includes uh, Silver Spring, you know, even places. Uh, so it included a lot of towns and cities in the area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it also included, in addition to African Americans, it also often excluded Jews mm -hmm. and right. uh, Asians and others. So. Right. right. Anyway, thank you so much, Mayor Robinson. Really appreciate Thank you for having me. And yes, Thank you and so much. I think Carter and I will follow up with you on that other topic we talked about. And okay. And this was a wonderful kickoff for our corridor conversations. Uh, you've received the emails about them and Carter will uh, keep sending out reminders. We've got a wonderful monthly series um, and this was just the most wonderful way to start it off. So let me add my own thank you, Mayor Robinson. Thank you. The next Enjoy the rest of this minute. Okay, everybody. And the next okay. one. Is, the next one is with Carol Pearson. It's on. Um, I don't know. Your the stories you tell yourself. The stories that. Uh, but we will get that more information now. Right on a book she just published. Yeah.